Welcome to everybody. I'm uh, Massimo Tomasoli. I'm the permanent observer for international idea to the UN. And I'm uh, opening uh, today's meeting uh, also on behalf of the other partners of the I Know Politics uh, Initiative, uh, which is convening this uh, event on the occasion of the relaunch of its uh, website. So we have a new website and for a panel that will be moderated by uh, today's event um, uh, with ref respect to the uh, celebration of the International uh, Day uh, for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. And uh, I want to do it for a specific reason, because when uh, uh, we consider why the 25th of November has been chosen for celebrating this day, we have to go back to um, the background. And the background, uh, it struck me, uh, is a background related to political violence against women. Or in other words, violence against women were engaged in politics and in the defense of human rights. And as you uh, all know, these were uh, three sisters uh, the Mirabal sisters who had been uh, uh, kidnapped and uh, beaten to death uh, by the henchmen of the uh, dictator Rafael Trujillo in uh, uh, the Dominican Republic back uh, in 1960. So uh, it struck me the fact that uh, violence against women which uh, encompasses a wide range of uh, sectors and uh, dimensions of the life of women um, is being celebrated since 1999 to remember three brave uh, women who actually engaged in politics, engaged in a grassroots movement against the dictator and were killed for that. Uh, it, uh, uh, it is very telling in my view because when we talk about violence against women, we refer to a global phenomenon uh, that is prevalent in every country, uh, which is one of the leading causes for morbidity for women. It is, uh, according to a study carried out by UN Women, uh, among women aged uh, between 15 and 44, uh, acts of violence cause more death and disability than cancer, malaria, traffic accidents, and war combined. And this is very pervasive and it is linked and embedded to uh, culture. So in many instances, it is simply not perceived as anything different or strange than what happens in society at large. But in fact, it has um, and shouldn't be dismissed as simply the cost of doing politics, risks that are related to the choice of engaging in, in public life. In fact, these, are, uh, these acts of violence against women engaged in politics uh, pose a serious threat to democracy and raise questions about the progress that has been made globally towards incorporating women fully as political actors. Um, recent research, um, I, I just mentioned the research on political parties in Honduras, for example, uh, shows that uh, there are various manifestations of uh, violence uh, that have been considered typical in the exercise of politics. And that is irrespective of whether uh, politicians or actors are women or men. So there is a culture of violence that is embedded in the culture of politics. But nevertheless, women are the objects of specific violence due to the social cultural constructs of gender that reproduce patterns and stereotypes of inequality and discrimination in politics. And this study that was carried out by uh, NDI and uh, uh, others, um, these uh, patterns refer to the violence towards women in politics occurring in partisan life, in the selection and nomination to the candidate lists for positions of elected office 
and also in the exercise of council and municipal office. So it really covers the broad range, all the phases, all the elements of uh, political life. Um, women uh, members of parliament, according to a recent study by the IPU, uh, also experience, um, and that is irrespective of their uh, country of origin or region, uh, experience harassment and acts of violence uh, during their political life. And that is uh, including by making use of new technologies, the role of social media and uh, uh, hated speech uh, in uh, the uh, face of uh, candidates or politicians who exercise their public office is something that is uh, particularly uh, growing over the last uh, uh, years. And uh, violence and harassment inhibit women's equal participation in politics by discouraging them to run for office, um, undermining their electoral uh, fortunes, or forcing them to ally with powerful male elites for protection or compromise their political agenda in uh, other ways. So it's a way of manipulating the political uh, landscape, which uses uh, cultural norms and stereotypes by um, targeting the uh, weakness of uh, citizens who should actually be protected in their basic human rights. And this is therefore, in our view, a human rights issue. It is not simply something that should be dismissed as related to the specificity of a cultural uh, situation of a cultural context or the cultural norms of a particular region. Um, so what can be done? There is a tendency towards trying to reform uh, legal uh, frameworks and actually legal reforms are extremely important. Uh, and um, I remember International Day organized uh, a series of consultations on women empowerment in different regions and the consultation that I attended, the one on Latin America and the Caribbean, um, was followed by a meeting on um, a sort of a legal bill, a template for legal bills on combating violence against women in politics. A very interesting initiative uh, that uh, is supported by regional uh, institutions in Latin America and the Caribbean. And it was very, very interesting to see how pervasive this phenomenon is in order to prevent um, uh, women to access politics or exercise their uh, political and civil rights. However, uh, even when implemented, legal reforms are not enough because there is an issue, a very important issue, and a gap in terms of um, enhancement, enforcement, and implementation of laws. In fact, uh, in a situation that I described before as uh, one where the political culture influences behavior, uh, it is no surprise that having legal frameworks in place can also be bypassed by interpretations, uh, by lack of resources made available in order to implement the laws, or simply by denial uh, of uh, rights, even when they are recognized by the law. So what can be uh, done uh, next? I think that today's event looks exactly also at that dimension, which is the dimension of implementation. Um, th there are also I inherent difficulties in legal reforms. First, it can be difficult to distinguish between violence directed against women due to their gender identity and other forms of political violence, uh, particularly since the latter may still manifest itself and is experienced in gendered ways. Uh, also, uh, legislation can help mobilize public opinion and shift societal attitudes, but it also depends on, on these uh, enforcement mechanisms. Uh, and finally, legal codi codifications are always narrow and they have to be narrow in terms of uh, definitions, but uh, they uh, not always match the living and lived experiences of uh, 
harassment by uh, women. So we do have to get more into implementation by engaging with the wider public, by engaging with actors that are present uh, in uh, civil society, by engaging with uh, scholars and, um, and also media uh, actors. So just a few words for what we are doing today. Uh, as I said, we are gathered for celebrating the launch of the new website of An I Know Politics. I Know Politics is a, a, a partnership with four um, uh, partners at the moment, International IDEA, the Interparliamentary Union, the United Nations Development Program, and the United Nations Entity for Gender Equality and the Empowerment for Women. Uh, these organizations are all committed to promoting equitable participation of women in politics and government as an essential dimension for building and sustaining uh, democracy. Uh, I know politics can be a tool for convening all those actors that I listed uh, before and for sharing good practices in terms of legal reforms and implementation of such reforms. It can bring together people for this purpose. And today we'll actually listen to the findings of work and research that is already available out there and sometimes difficult to access. I Know Politics is a platform that makes this information accessible. It is also interactive and therefore those who are uh, facing particular problems, uh, for example, with respect to a specific form of violence experienced in their political life, can actually look for uh, examples or even um, reach out to the wide network of uh, women uh, who experience similar situations and more broadly to the politicians who are engaged and other civil society actors who are engaged in the I know politics uh, network. So uh, I think there is one last uh, word to say. I want to make uh, uh, more explicit the link between violence against women and the implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. As you all know, uh, SDG 5 on gender equality uh, has a specific target on uh, violence against women. And uh, measurements are underway already two years into the implementation of the 2030 Agenda on, uh, on that uh, particular uh, global phenomenon that I explained before. It would be very important to measure also violence against women in politics. That is an important aspect because it, it is a barrier that prevents engagement of women in uh, politics. That means also engaging in public policies in order to achieve the uh, sustainable development goals as a whole. Let's consider then these as a contributing factor to the achievement of SDG 5 as a goal. Uh, to uh, the uh, fact that uh, gender equality is an enabler for the achievement of the goals as a whole and it is also an accelerator in order to achieve uh, the uh, objectives of the 2030 Agenda uh, by uh, the 2030 target. So uh, let's not forget that addressing violence against women, including political violence, is a human rights issue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Massimo, for those uh, introductory words. Uh, my name is Charles Chavelle. I'm the uh, team leader of the Inclusive Political Processes team at UNDP, uh, one of the partners, as Massimo has said, of the uh, INO Politics platform. I'm delighted that my colleague Nika Saidi is also here. She's a member of the INO Politics steering group. Uh, my uh, Honour <coughs> is to act as moderator today for the two panels that we have. Uh, as a former Member of Parliament myself from New Zealand, uh, where finally uh, the country is um, breaking out of having been stuck at around 30% for the last three or four 
uh, parliamentary terms in terms of representation of women, we're now getting uh, much, much closer to 40% as a result of the elections that were held two months ago. This is largely the result of the adoption by two parties, one large and one smaller, of a voluntary quota. Uh, and I think uh, we, um, uh, we, we, we've heard from Massimo and we will hear from, from the other speakers about the, the effect of, uh, the deterrent effect of violence against uh, women in politics. And I think uh, I'm reminded uh, when I think of those statistics from my own country about the fact that violence comes in many forms. Uh, we've heard uh, in the introductory remarks about some of the grosser forms of violence, but bullying, uh, the creation of unsafe environments, uh, the, uh, <coughs> the, the creation of glass ceilings uh, can in, in many ways be uh, also very invidious barriers and forms of violence against women in political participation. Uh, which we also, I think, need to be to be very vigilant about. I just want to, before I introduce our speakers, make two points. The first is uh, that uh, I know politics uh, is going to be relaunching its platform uh, as part of this event, um, and UNDP, along with the other uh, three partners, IPU, International Idea, and UN Women, uh, is recommitting to the support of the platform for another year. We think uh, for all the reasons that Massimo mentioned, it is a very valuable platform uh, and one that we are keen to continue to support. The other point that I wanted to make while I have the opportunity uh, follows on from Massimo's question about what can we do about the phenomenon of violence against women in politics. And for those of you who haven't seen it, there's an excellent guide, <coughs> um, if I do say so myself, uh, that UNDP and UN Women recently co collaborated on to, to produce. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very, I think, definitive knowledge product on uh, how to uh, identify and deal with violence against women in elections, a, a, an extremely important part of women's political participation uh, and leadership. So if you, if you haven't seen this document, it is available on both the UNDP and UN Women websites, and I do very, and 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 of course on the new INO Politics platform. Uh, so uh, I do commend it to you. I think it's uh, it's it's very well worth reading, and I know that our country officers and and UN country teams have found it very valuable, uh, even in the short time that it's been available. So uh, I'd like to now introduce our first panelist. Uh, and we're very pleased uh, and proud to uh, have Margaret Kainanellen uh, on uh, a virtual link. Uh, welcome, uh, good afternoon, uh, and uh, I'd just like to introduce Margaret to you. She's uh, somebody who has had a distinguished career uh, since 2003 as a member of the Swiss National Council, the, the federal parliamentary body of Switzerland. Uh, she's the current president of the Swiss delegation uh, to the IPU, and she's been a, a permanent member of that delegation uh, for the last six years. Uh, she uh, has chaired the Committee of Finance on the National Council. Uh, she's been uh, vice chair and now chair of the Swiss delegation uh, of the Parliamentary Assembly uh, of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. She's a member of the International Board of Peace Women Across the Globe, promoting peace tables, and she's done that work since 2008. She's a former mayor, uh, and she's rapporteur for the International Commission of Jurists for Southeast Asia, among many other achievements. So uh, when, it term, when it comes to um, practical experience at uh, smashing glass ceilings, we have an expert as our first panelist. Welcome, Margaret. I turn the floor over to you. I'm talking here from the lobby of the Swiss Parliament, which you see in the background. So um, the sound was not always very good. You would like me to um, speak on experiences? Yes, if you, if you would share with us maybe five or ten minutes of your own experience. Uh, experiences? Yes, thank you. Okay, practical examples. Okay, um, you stop when I get too long, please. <laughs> 
Okay. I think I think my first uh, real um, yeah uh, bad experience was uh, when I was a mayor, uh, and I stood uh, for my uh, second re-election as a mayor. Uh, I was the first female mayor of a town just north of the capital city of Bern, Switzerland. And uh, uh, one evening, January, uh, getting dark, um, one uh, gunshot was, uh, was uh, given off. The bullet or the projectile passed before our apartment. It really... Um, uh, it really uh, made my youngest son um, an uh, very uh, nervous. It passed before our apartment outside, but it hit the window of our neighbor uh, who was knitting, and it uh, passed before the head of our neighbor um, about uh, only uh, three feet in front of her head. So that was before my second re-election. Um, the uh, author could never be found. The police said it's very, very odd, very strange. Never in such a town had they had a shot given, uh, given you know, in a neighborhood. It was quite evident uh, the shot was to alarm me and, uh, okay. Uh, maybe second uh, second um, incident uh, before uh, no that was uh, February 2014 as a national councillor. Uh, I criticized on Swiss television uh, one of our federal councillors, minister, for having placed. Uh, about half a billion um, Swiss francs offshore. Uh, and I asked him on television to give transparency on how, how much tax he had uh, saved, how much tax he had not paid in Switzerland through this offshore uh, placement in Luxembourg and in Jersey Island. Uh, when I went home by train the same night, I received an email threatening me, um, threatening me. Uh, that email was repeated a uh, little later. Uh, the author could be found and was, uh, uh, was then uh, sentenced uh, to a monetary fine um, of quite some amount. Uh, shortly after, I had a threat by letter to rape me and to murder me, uh, but not only me, also my two sons and my husband. And the threat in the letter contained that um, uh, whatever I could do, I could uh, hire bodyguards to protect me. It w nothing would help me from being um, raped and murdered. Uh, what was weird about this, it was not only the anonymous letter. Uh, about two days later, um, there came a phone call with a male voice uh, saying exactly the same sentences. We want to rape you, we want to kill you, etc. Okay, I always deposited a criminal complaint right away. I mean, I always just, uh, uh, yeah, um, called, uh, called the police. I'm a practicing lawyer myself. It was quite weird for me <laughs> to appeal to police, to general prosecution, to the courts, but I did, and I'm very happy I did because. Uh, not only some of the authors uh, were found and sentenced, uh, but also weapons uh, could be confiscated. That brings me to another incident. Briefly before my third re-election as a national councillor, October 2015, I had an organization, and now I must show you something. I don't know if you can see it. 
I had the. Uh, can you see this? Yes. A little bit. Mm -hmm. This is a. This is a red sticker, that was put for, ab about fifty thousand dollars. This. This red sticker was put on all the newspapers of my constituency around Bern, Switzerland. This cost about $50,000. That's more than what my electoral campaign cost in 2015. And it asked people uh, not to re-elect me. And um, it was, it was uh, put by uh, by the lobby of very rich foreign people who reside in Switzerland and who are taxed by a lump sum privileged, very privileged system. And I was um, campaigning with others against this lump sum uh, strategy. Um, this gave me uh, worse results in the elections. I, I was re-elected. Uh, I was re-elected and I, com uh, I lodged a complaint against this, the organization that is responsible for this sticker. Uh, the general prosecutor sentenced the president of this organization a couple months ago, uh, but then last week uh, the, that president did not appeal, appealed against that sentence um, by the general prosecutor of Bern. Uh, last, just a week ago, last Wednesday, we had a one-day court hearing at the end of which uh, a, criminal, a, a criminal court, a one-man court, right-wing, right-wing judge, one right-wing judge, um, uh, released, revoked, revoked, that sentence uh, and liberated that uh, president from the um, charge of uh, defamation, defamation against me. Now I appeal to the higher court of Bern, and uh, I do not accept that no one is held responsible for this. Worst case, I was th threatened by. A weapon to be killed in case I was re-elected on October 18, 2015. One man wrote me emails, two emails, about 10 days before that election day, saying that um, fortunately he had a pistol uh, and in case I was re-elected, he was very happy that he lived close to me. He would right away um, come to kill me in case I was re-elected. Okay, that was 10 days before election day. Uh, time enough uh, that police uh, could um, yeah, uh, find, identify, identify, identify the, of course, the provider and the, the personal computer from which um, these threats had uh, been addressed to me, and that man was held in, in uh, police custody the day before the election and the day of the election, and then he was released at the end of election day. Uh, the, his weapons were confiscated. Uh, he was sentenced and uh, for that threat, uh, severe, he was sentenced for the severe threat and uh, the weapons remained confiscated, and of course he was also fined to a monetary, monetary um, penalty. At this moment, I still have ongoing a complaint before the Swiss Press Council. Uh, this is a, sort of a, um, a arbitration council. It's not a court, but it's an arbitration council which um, uh, which uh, judges uh, defamation, harassment, uh, violence done by media. And I complained about a tweet 
which defamated not only me, but also another woman politician from the city of Basel. She is a member of a green alternative group. I'm a member of the Socialist Party for a long time here in Switzerland. Uh, and it will be the first um, proceeding before that press council, which will statue um, on defamation done by a tweet. So that's about my story. Uh, <laughs> I was well, I was well, let's say, I was well um, protected and uh, uh, counseled by federal police in Switzerland. That was a positive experience for me, but I had to take a lot of precautionary measures for my own security, and I had police protection from um, February 2014 for about two years. Okay, so that's my, <laughs> my story so far. I'll be glad to answer any questions as well as I can. Uh, Margaret, <coughs> thank you for being willing to share those experiences with us and reminding us that even in a highly developed context, politically and economically and socially, such as Switzerland, these sorts of experiences are, uh, are sadly uh, ones that uh, women who are active in politics have to face. Our next panellist <coughs> is Marisol Perez Tejo, President of the Human Rights Centre of the San Martin de Porres University. Now, she was uh, the Minister of Justice and Human Rights in Peru between 2016 and 2017 uh, and a member of the Congress of Peru between 2011 and 2016. She's a professor in human rights and in the inter-American human rights system and is involved in advocating for public policies against corruption and the protection of the rights of indigenous peoples uh, she's also a researcher and author of several articles on human rights. Uh, a practicing lawyer, she holds degrees in constitutional law from the uh, Catholic Pontifical University of Peru uh, and also from the University of San Martin de Porres. Uh, we are absolutely delighted uh, to have you join us and uh, I now invite you to uh, make your remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. First, I would like to thank ID International, represented by Mr. Massimo Tomasoli, the woman at the U United Nations, the Interparliamentary Union, and UNDP. It is a privilege for me to share this moment of reflections of the role of women in politics. In this message, I will speak first about my experience in politics, how I became involved and how I progressed, and after that, I will answer the three questions that have been asked. My direct participation in politics began at age 17 in college as a student leader in the student union movement, having been elected secretary general of the movement and later secretary general of the Federated Student Center. The only woman to have occupied that post. In the same time, I was member of the PPC party and I received political formation with the help of the Conrad and our step to foundation. I withdrew from life in politics to development professionally so as to avoid economic dependence or politics and this has permitted me to speak out, never remaining, silent and to make decisions of the basis of what I feel is correct. I returned to political participation 10 years later in the position of Departmental Secretary of Trainer at the request of a woman, the President of my party, Dr. Lourdes Flores Nano. I continued creating a role in the party and ran for Congress for the first time in 2006. In 2011, I had the opportunity to compete in my party, the PPC party, to accompany the current president of the Republic as vice president. With the national presidential candidate, we had made an electoral alliance and all agree that a woman should be included in the list of candidates. I ran within the PPC because I had worked with groups of party members among the many women and I accompanied as a second vice president the current president of Peru. At that moment we were unable to pass the second round of elections, however I was elected to parliament. 
I did not run for election because at that time I did not agree with the alliance my party made, but I helped with government planning. And the current president asked me to accompany him in the Ministry of Justice and Human Rights. I request a leave from my party and accompanied him. Right now I'm running for Secretary General of the PPC party in the election coming up in a few days. This experience has important highlights that the president of my party is a woman, that we have a system of gender chorus in the country and a lower current alternation in the party are situations that facilitated my participation. In the Congress, I was assigned responsibilities related to my experience. Indigenous people, constitution, justice, foreign relations, women commission and family commission the five years. Now that we have covered the personal context, I will go on with the specific questions. The first question that they made me, have I experienced abuse or any form of violence as a woman participating in politics? Being a woman has not been a problem for my political career. On the contrary, I'm conscious that all the describable events were opportunities made available because I'm a woman uh, and I took advantage of them. Yes, the, there was violence in the sense that I have been insulted, but in terms of aesthetics and sexuality. Presumably, people who insult me think that this was offend me most. This violence above it all in Twitter is very clear. The insults are never about my capacity, nor are they criticism about a proposed law or concrete political policy. They are always related to roles assigned to as a woman. Second, what efforts or practice has the party to which I belong and the country made to promote political participation of women and to avoid a type of gender violence? The country has adopted a quota law. Nevertheless, the procedures that need to be implemented to assure success have not been followed. For example, there is no baseline that explains what social processes need to be pushed forward to take affirmative measures that warranty education, equal pay for equal work, among others. Nor have the quota laws been evaluated to see if they have generated the expected results. They have detected that past the elected with preferential votes, fulfilled the feminine quota. But where the votes are not preferential, women occupy the last places because alternation of genders is not being respected. In my party, the PPC alternation was incorporated in the status. And we were the only party to have three women and three men in parliament. Unfortunately, we have regressed and alternation has been eliminated from the party status. I should clarify that the topic has been discussed in Parliament during the past several years. Isolated affirmative measures have been taken that are not necessarily applied in the context of a quota law. There are political participation programs for indigenous women or young women. And to the feminine quote, one could add the indigenous quota uh, of 15, 15% in sons that have a majority population or 10% of young women. In all the quota laws, there is a lack of technical rules and adequate procedures. Third, what do you recommend to women who choose not to participate in politics as a reaction to discrimination or violence? Women should face violence valiantly. We need to create a country and a society better for the future generations. And this is a fight we have to continue. It did not begin with us and it will not end with us. In Peru, the female vote was won through a municipal election as the argument at that moment that members of parliament focuses on was related to the role of women. Since women do the shopping in markets and the municipality regulates the markets, women have a right to express their opinion. But these advances, also slow, are important. With the velocity that technology has generated, we lose perception that social processes are generational and require time. We women must work so that countries enact gender quota and alternation laws against political abuse that has been under discussion for several years, that they take affirmative measures necessarily so that law fulfills objectives that affect education, training, and equal pay for equal work. I would tell women who want to participate in politics to assume the challenge. Do not accept no for an answer. Get trained to represent what they are as people and women. 
that we share a common cause with intelligent men and women of the world, more important than personal causes. Our conduct opens the road ahead for other women. I think we have advances greatly in the participation of women in politics and the participation of women in the university and academic and political forums is growing more evident. It is our task to end the inequality that creates limits in some countries and to guarantee effective and efficient participation of women in politics. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marisol. Uh, we've heard from two uh, elected officials, uh, one from Switzerland, uh, one from Peru. Now we're going to be reminded that the problem of uh, violence against women needs to also be addressed in other fields of public life, including civil society and uh, public service. We are very privileged to have as our third panelist in this uh, part of the event, Ines Carrasco, the first secretary of the permanent mission of the plurinational state of Bolivia to the United Nations. She's somebody who uh, throughout her career in different uh, ways has promoted human rights. Uh, she's been a specialist in Bolivia's office for the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, where she was responsible as the focal point for economic, social and cultural rights, international human rights, protections mechanisms, human rights indicators and technical assistance to Bolivian state institutions and civil society organizations on periodic reporting. Uh, covering uh, many of those matters. Uh, Ms Carrasco is a lawyer by, by background. She holds degrees in economic, social and cultural rights as well as uh, in, in law and uh, we are absolutely delighted to welcome her to the panel and to invite her to make her remarks. Well, thank you so much. Good morning and uh, thank you very much for the presentation. On behalf of the permanent mission of Bolivia to the United Nations and of the Ambassador Sacha Llorente, who unfortunately cannot be present today, let me thank the organizing institutions for convening this important event in the framework of the 16 days of activism against gender violence. It is a pleasure for Bolivia to participate in these discussions, which allow us to share our advances in the promotion and protection of women's rights. In this opportunity, and as requested, uh, we will share with you the Bolivian law against harassment and political violence against women. As an introduction, I would like to mention that during the past years, the regulatory and institutional framework of Bolivia has been built on the basis of a political constitution that establishes not only a non-sexist language, but also recognizes civil, political, economic, social, and political rights of women, with the aim of eliminating those conditions of subordination, discrimination, social exclusion, and cultural practices that constituted for years obstacles for the advance, advancement of women in Bolivia. Throughout the whole constitution, different articles refer to equality of opportunities, gender equity and participation, equivalence of conditions between men and women, the right of all citizens to participate freely in equity and on equal terms in the formation, exercise and control of the political power directly or through their representatives, the prohibition of all forms of discriminations based on gender, the elimination and punishment of gender violence, gender equity in the composition of the cabinet of ministers, and the parity and alternation of gender in the composition of departmental assemblies. From the Constitution and within the most advanced norms of protection of the rights of women, it is worth mentioning also the Law 348, Comprehensive Law to Guarantee Women a Life Free of Violence, composed of a comprehensive protection system for women in situations of violence, recognizing 16 types of violence against women and incorporating measures for the prevention, protection and punishment of violence against women in the criminal, labor, education and healthcare spheres. Also, it is important to highlight the law on combating trafficking in persons, which aims to combat human trafficking and related crimes through the consolidation of prevention measures and mechanism protection, attention, prosecution, and criminal punishment of these crimes. Another important law in getting into the subject of this presentation is precisely the Law Against Harassment and Political Violence Against Women of 2012, which is part of this new regula regulatory framework aimed to restructure an old system that used to violate women's rights. 
As background of this law, it is worth mentioning that only, six, uh, only 16 years ago in Bolivia, women could not exercise the right to vote. 35 years ago, of 129 deputies, only one was a, a woman and not one senator. 20 years ago, Bolivia had the first female senator and this number was maintained during several periods of government until 2005, in which woman, women got by the first time four senators. Faced with these situations, back in 2010, the president enacted the law on the electoral regime, which establishes in Article 2 that Bolivian democracy is based on the equity and gender and equality of opportunities between women, between, between women and men for the exercise of their individual and collective rights, applying a parity and alternation in the list of candidates for all positions of government and representation. It also establishes that uh, the uh, Legislative Assembly should guarantee that 50% of the pre-selected persons should be women. And it sanctions political harassment, stating that a person who harasses a candidate or candidate during or after an electoral process in order to obtain, against her will, the renouncement of her candidacy or position shall be sanctioned with imprisonment of two years. As of this law, all the legal provisions contrary to this establishment were repealed and the regularity adaption was carried out respectively. The law on the electoral regime was definitely a major breakthrough in the political rights of women in Bolivia. However, there were cases which women had been elected who were first to resign their position so that they alternate a man could accede to the political position. So in order to strengthen and ensure that full exercise of women's political rights, the law against harassment and political violence women was enacted. This is definitely an innovative law, pioneer and unique worldwide. It is considered one of the best policies in the world to put an end to the political violence against women, for which it was received different recognition, such as the honorable mention of the World Future Council in the, po in the Future Policy Award of 2014, for being one of the most advanced standards in its kind. The law against harassment and political violence against women aims to establish mechanism for prevention, attention and penalties against acts of harassment, political violence against candidates or elected women or during the exercise of their political public duties in order to guarantee full exercise of their political rights. It is based on the principles of equal opportunities, non-violence, non-discrimination, equity, political participation, social control, despatriarchalization, intercultural culturality and, pos and positive action. According to this law, the acts considered as harassment or political violence and that can be denunciated are, among others, impose the carrying out of activities outside the duties and attributions of their positions, provide candidates or elected women with false, erroneous or inaccurate information that leads to the inadequate performance of their political public duties. Avoid by any means the elected titular or substitute women attend the sessions or any other activities that involves decision making. Prevent or restrict their incorporation to their duties after a justified license. Restrict the use of the word in sessions or, or other meetings. Restrict or prevent the use of constitutional legal actions to protect their rights. Uh, the complaint may be verbal or written and presented by the victim or any other person. The law establishes minor, serious and very serious faults with administrative sanctions that may go from written reprimand, 20% discount and suspensions of their duties for 30 days without benefit salary. There are aggravating circumstances on situations of pregnancy, that the victim is over 60 years of age, has no schooling, is a woman with a disability, is a second offense, involved of the children and or committed by two or more people. In case that during the administrative or disciplinary process it is concluded that there are indications of criminal responsibility, the impeachment should be remitted to the public prosecutor's office, which is the body that is responsible for the criminal prosecution in Bolivia. Accordingly, the criminal code has modified and now incorporates two new criminal types that punish with the probation of liberty from one to eight years. In the event that the candidates elected or in the exercise of the political public duties no longer wishes to exercise their political positions, they must submit a renouncement to their candidacy or political position to the plurinational electoral body, which will analyze if the decision to resign is free of mechanisms of pressure or political harassment and that they truly responds to a voluntary decision. In the case that it is evident that the renouncement was medi mediated by situations of political harassment and violence, it will remit it to the public prosecutor's offices and the renouncement will not be considered as valid. valid. Today, 10 years after the structural changes promoted by the government of President Evo Morales, Bolivia has 
seven women deputies out of a total of 130 seats and 16 female senators out of a total of 36 seats. Bolivia is the second country in the world that the, and in the first in America with the largest number of women in parliament. Finally, we would like to mention that in Bolivia and around the world, there is still work to be done so that women can assume a decisive role in decision making. Even in the United Nations itself, the empowerment of women is still a pending issue. The access of women to positive leadership and in different spaces and levels is still limited, and there are no enabled environments and facilities that allow them to exercise their right to motherhood and the right to their professional development if they wish so. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Ines, for sharing those uh, lessons learned from uh, Bolivia. What we would now propose to do is move to the second part of the panel um, and then invite questions and observations from the audience. Uh, Massimo has to make his uh, departure shortly because International Idea are sponsoring two other uh, panels today. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, thank you very much, uh, and, and, and Massimo, when you when you need to go, please uh, please just do what you you, you have to do. Um, but uh, what we now want to uh, really hear about is um, programming research on ending violence against women in politics, and then. Um, move to the, uh, the the relaunch of the website itself. Uh, so uh, we're going to um, start with, um, I think, hearing from Gabriela, if that's okay. Uh, Gabriela is UN Women's uh, Global Policy Specialist on Political Participation. Uh, she supports UN Women's programs on women's political empowerment and leadership including in electoral assistance, parliamentary strengthening, intergovernmental processes, research and policy development. Uh, so I'm delighted that we, we have uh, Gabriela here to, to speak. Thank you very much, Charles, and um, thank you. It's an honor to be presenting today among such a distinguished panel um, on a, in such an important, although difficult topic, uh, violence against women in politics, but also to be part of this um, exciting event to relaunch the I Know Politics uh, platform um, on which I've been uh, privileged to, to, to work and be involved for, for a number of years, so thank you. Um, today, um, I'm just going to briefly highlight um, the guidebook that um, Charles mentioned earlier. Um, I think there was a question from uh, our viewers watching on Facebook Live about the exact title. Um, the title is Preventing Violence Against Women in Elections, a Programming Guide. So that's just to answer that, that question that just came, came in through the, the wires. Um, but in my brief remarks, I just want to mention three things. Um, one, what UN Women is doing on the issue of violence against women in politics um, to uh, help uh, announce the publication of this guide together with our, our uh, partner UNDP um, and highlight a few elements of the guide, um, which, uh, as mentioned earlier, you can access on uh, iknowpolitics.org after this event um, and also on the websites of, of UNDP uh, and UN Women. So firstly, on, on, on the issue of violence against women in politics, this is um, a, a very important um, issue for UN women and, and a priority in our work to uh, promote women's political empowerment and leadership around the world. Um, what we are doing are really three main things. We are working very hard uh, with our international partners around the globe to raise awareness and advance the issue of political of violence against women in politics into the normative uh, agenda. Um, and, and doing events such as these and is, is very much part of that effort. Um, we're also working um, with partners at international, regional, and national levels, as well as the global academic community, um, to help advance um, a, a new field of programming research. So um, while this issue is, is very prevalent and something that uh, touches uh, um, uh, every country in the world, no country is immune from the phenomenon of, of violence against women, um, 
uh, it is still very much under understudied and, and, and falling between the margins of, of the fields of uh, electoral violence uh, generally and violence against women and gender-based violence. Um, and so uh, we are supporting the, the, the work to advance the, the research elements um, of this issue. And then finally, um, and, and this is very much linked to the guidebook being launched today, um, we are working with our country offices and our national partners around the world to um, support uh, national level prevention mitigation responses, um, including on data collection related to, to violence against women in politics. So um, with that, um, again, I'd like to just highlight a few elements of this guidebook. Um, although it's published today, this work really started, I think, as far back as 2011 um, and, and is, is part of our, our longstanding partnership with UNDP to promote women's political empowerment and leadership and especially um, women's political participation in the electoral cycle. And it focuses on um, programming actions in, in five key areas with examples from more than 40 countries. Um, and so it's a very um, uh, rich text, but not intimidating in its size, um, but that gives a lot of practical examples of what's being done at country level, as well as some uh, testimonies from women in politics themselves uh, and examples of legal advancements and, and program responses, um, some of which we heard earlier in the remarks. And um, it's really intended for uh, those best positioned to act to, to end violence against women in politics, and that includes international organizations, um, including uh, those working on electoral assistance support programs, women's political participation, or the implementation of human rights, or ending violence against women, but also for national institutions, political parties, election management bodies, uh, and so on. It's um, divided into two main parts. So one is understanding violence against women in elections. Um, it provides a definition of uh, violence against women in politics and, and elections. Um, uh, offers a typology of the types of violence that women face uh, in, uh, in politics and elections, um, as well as who the victims and, and perpetrators are. Um, and the second part is really the, the programming actions that I mentioned earlier. And this includes, um, first and foremost, mapping and measuring violence against women in elections, integrating violence against women uh, in elections into uh, election observation and violence monitoring. And I should mention there are a number of um, examples provided in the guide of ongoing initiatives from different international uh, and national organizations. Uh, for example, um, the National Democratic Institute um, and its uh, uh, Votes Without Violence initiative to work with citizen observation and monitoring groups, um, as well as the uh, International uh, Foundation for Electoral Systems and their programs to support citizen monitoring groups on the ground in, in data collection observing violence against women in elections. Um, it also covers extensively legal and policy reform to prevent and respond to violence against women in elections, um, highlighting um, the uh, law against political harassment and violence in Bolivia, as our um, colleague just explained, as well as some other legal reform initiatives around the world. The fourth programming area is focused on preventing and mitigating violence against women in elections through electoral arrangements. Um, so that includes um, work that can be done, for example, with national election commissions, um, with um, uh, the, the judicial and police forces, and all of the electoral stakeholders to ensure that, um, that there are protection and monitoring mechanisms in place to prevent um, this from happening during electoral periods. Um, the fifth area is working with political parties um, to prevent and reduce violence against women in, in elections. And we heard from um, Madame Tejo earlier that um, violence against women at the political party level can take place in, in, in many different forms. And so this includes working with political parties as institutions to develop a code of conduct, for example, to say that we have zero tolerance policy for any form of violence against women in elections. Um, it might also mean um, political parties uh, supporting women candidates to access um, financial support from the party in equal measure to men, um, and in general, reforming as an institution to ensure that the environment is not especially hostile to women um, 
And the sixth area of programming uh, responses, uh, as highlighted in the guide, is raising awareness and changing norms. And so this is so important, as we've heard earlier, um, sometimes reforms and, and mitigation measures in place and legal reform, um, if not properly implemented, um, can have limited impact. And so it's important to continuously be working throughout the electoral cycle to raise awareness about this issue, uh, spark outrage and provoke outrage through the testimonials and the data that's available, um, and also um, to, to work to end it. And so some key examples are given in here, some different ongoing campaigns. Um, the, the, the work of the Interparliamentary Union is highlighted, as we'll hear in a moment. Um, so there's data that can be used to raise awareness. Uh, online campaigns like uh, NDI's Not the Cost campaign um, highlights different testimonials. Um, and there are different initiatives like the He for She uh, campaign launched by UN Women, including um, uh, uh, the He for She campaign adopted at parliamentary level uh, so that male champions of gender equality and women empowerment can speak out against this issue. So in the interest of time, I'll stop there. Happy to take your questions, and thank you very much. Please um, do check out the guide online, and for those of you in the room, copies are available. Thank you very much, Gabriella. Our final uh, speaker and panelist uh, today is the Honourable Patricia Torsney, Paddy Torsney, the uh, permanent observer of the uh, Interparliamentary Union to the United Nations. Uh, we're very fortunate to uh, have Patty here because she is another uh, former uh, elected member of uh, Parliament, in this case uh, a former member of the House of Commons uh, from Canada. She uh, represented Burlington, Ontario in Parliament from 1993 to 2006. She was a Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for the Environment between 1998 and 2000 and to the Minister for International Cooperation uh, between 2004 to 2006. So, uh, <clears throat> as with uh, uh, Marisol, she has experience in the Congress, but also as a member of the Executive and as a Privy Councillor from Canada. Uh, so, Paddy, we're delighted to uh, hand the floor to you to talk about, uh, if you wish, your own experiences, but also, of course, uh, the IPU's very important work in this area. Thank you. Thanks, Charles. And um, I was also, uh, interestingly, the chair, first chair of the Women's Caucus. And uh, as a young member of Parliament, often mistaken for a staff member, um, and that I think actually offered opportunities as well as challenges. Um, but uh, when we came to this issue, uh, you know, the IPU, first of all, has been working to increase women's representation in Parliaments for many years, some 30 years of work working to get the stats on how many women are in Parliament, how many women are in the executive, and what roles they're playing, how many women speakers there are, how many deputy speakers, so that we really have data. And when it came to raising this issue of violence against women MPs, we went out and studied the issue to find out what are the facts. And um, uh, so after many years of working with men and women to stop violence in all its forms, um, working on domestic legislation, and, um, on uh, uh, violence in the home, on sexual assault, on female genital mutilation and child marriage, we, d we put forward this report. And, and the reason it's important, of course, is that we need to make sure that women are at the decision-making table. Why is it important that a parliament is more representative? Because you get better decision-making. We have complicated problems in the world. We need all the best ideas at the table not just the ones that are from one gender or another. We need young people, we need older people, we need a really representative parliament. And we need to make sure that different parts of the society are represented, whether it's minority populations. And that was something that was distressing in the research as well that came out. So in 2016, um, we did this study by doing in-depth interviews with 55 women MPs from uh, 39 countries. We covered five regions of the world. We surveyed the parliaments on measures that were taken to prevent and eliminate sexist behavior, violence, and harassment. And we got real data where, why, and in what forms this violence occurs, who were the perpetrators, what was the prevalence, 
And we also really work to alert members of parliament to the fact that this is taking place. And um, I, I know that from some of the interviewers, it was shocking for them to, um, to go through and hear what some of the stories were. And I think for a lot of the, I know that we timed the survey and they ran me through it and I was saying, oh wait, oh wait, I forgot about that. And so women had really processed, like me and others had just processed what we'd gone through and not, it, it forgotten about some of it. So getting it out on the table and actually understanding it was really quite important. In fact, the results showed that everywhere, in every country, there's some degree of harassment or uh, discrimination or violence. And 81% of the respondents said that they had experienced some form of psychological violence. 44.4% said that they had received threats of rape, beatings, kidnapping, or death. 65% of the respondents had been subjected to disparaging sexist remarks, focusing on their appearance, their marital status, or their private life. A lot of these are made on social media. It's very hard to defend against. And it affects the Member of Parliament, it affects their families, and it really makes women question whether or not they want to be in that environment. The prevalence of other forms of violence were troubling. Sexual harassment was 20%. Physical vi actual physical violence was 25.5%. The sexist remarks and sexual harassment really were, were the two main types of violence that were encountered. Most was from male MPs, their, their peers, um, often from their own parties, but also from the opposition party. Only 35.8% of the parliaments that participated in the study have regulations and codes to prevent this insulting and vulgar comments, unacceptable behavior, but most of them don't have speci specifics on what that entails. Only 21.2% of parliaments have a policy on sexual harassment against members, and uh, only 28% have a procedure to settle the matter. It's fine to raise the issue, but how are you going to resolve it? 60% of the respondents said they'd been subjected to sexist behavior and or violence. They had been intended to dissuade them from uh, them or their colleagues from continuing in politics. They were strongly motivated by the clear-cut positions they had taken, particularly when they were defending women's rights or human rights in general. Um, aggravating factors, and I alluded to this, being young is an additional problem. Being in an opposition party not a problem, it's an aggravating factor. Belonging to a minority group, working on specific issues like minority rights, or women's rights rather, or um, in general uh, when there is a context of insecurity and hostility toward those rights. Look, this violence complicates the lives of the members of parliament. They have to think about whether they want to express themselves freely. They have to think about where their travel is. They have to think about where their movements are. They have to be more prudent in their behavior, in their choices of the issues, in the places that they go. Most of them strengthened the security at home or at work. They filtered their emails or blocked phone calls. They shut down social media accounts. They had others read it. They asked their staff to monitor Facebook mm -hmm. and Twitter. And let's keep in mind that many of those staff members are women who are being violated as they look through that. 47%, almost 47%, had feared for their security and that of their family. And let's think about that. That's their mother or father, it's their spouse, but too often it's their children. And that should not be a cost of doing the job. 80% of those who have been victims of sexism or violence said that these acts would not undermine their determination to fulfill their parliamentary mandate or prevent them from running for another term. These women are tough, and they need to be to face what they're facing, but it doesn't have to be that way. The study shows that, to erect, that voice, giving voice to these problems, talking about the issues, actually is part of the solution. I know parliaments where women have actually got up and read the tweets that they have been subjected to, that they've repeated on the record, in Hansard, for everyone to hear. Women who are taking screen captions and reposting them. So these 
terrible people are caught out and shown to all of their friends and family exactly what they're saying to people. The study calls upon parliaments to define and apply policies and mechanisms to deter the behavior, to make sure that there are strong laws in, uh, in place on equality and combating sexism and violence against women, to look at new forms of violence, particularly these online threats and other forms of cyber violence. But until now, very few countries have addressed the question of violence against women in politics through legal and policy reforms. Bolivia is one of those countries, and in 2012 it adopted a specific law on harassment and violence against women politicians. So there's a need for strong internal mechanisms. As some of you know, Canada invoked a very strong code of conduct recently, and they actually provided all members with mandatory training and a sign-off that they will work to make sure so that they will pledge to uphold the, the code and work to create an environment free of sexual harassment. And that's important. You know, men observing others harassing people mm -hmm. is not pleasant for the men either. It shuts down everyone's behavior so, or, or ability to do their job. Um, so making sure that it's a safe environment for everyone is important. We also think that there's a need to change the culture. We need to make sure there are more women present so this stuff happens less. We need to help build the solidarity amongst women and change the mentality and the political culture. We need to work with male parliamentarians so that they understand the problem and that they are essential in, in building the support and, and shutting this stuff down. And of course we need to work with civil society, society and the media who plays a really important part in solving this problem and choosing what it focuses on. And we need to educate young people and all people to combat discrimination and build that culture of equality and tolerance. I also <coughs> wanted to note when you were talking as well about some of the actions you had, and one of the things you mentioned was the financing structures. Mm -hmm. When we look at financing for male and women candidates, we need to also think about what is being funded. In many cases, you need to add daycare or the ability to have family support so that a candidate can actually choose to run. More often than not, in most societies, that's the thing that women will ask for in financing and it's not provided, then men will ask for, although times will change. Our current, our next uh, work in progress, current steps in next pro, uh, work is that we're doing some regional studies on sexual, uh, uh, sexism, harassment, and violence against women in Europe. In 2018, IPU and PACE, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, will carry out a joint survey on sexism, harassment, and violence, and it will actually gather additional uh, data, focus on the regional level, and get into greater depth in those 47 European parliaments. They will look at a larger sample of women, and they will expand to female members of parliamentary staff, because I think that is also mm -hmm. part of the culture, and it's also where we're going to find some future members of parliament, hopefully. The research project will endeavor to take stock of the parliamentary institutions in Europe, what did they put in place, hopefully that will propel more of them to put in place measures to counter the problem, and we'll call on male parliamentarians in Europe to give their personal accounts, what have they witnessed, what are they doing to stop the problem. Um, we will collect data and analysis uh, uh, to support the efforts made by those parliaments in, in Europe and elsewhere to develop and implement institutional reforms. We're working on guidelines <coughs> for parliaments, members, and their staff. We recognize that the problem, we all are needing to recognize that the problem exists, and we need to have parliamentarians put their own house in order. You know, I listened to a leader the other day who said, we are the legislators. We're going out there and saying workplaces have to be, to be safe. We're passing laws. But if we don't have our own house in order as parliamentarians, who are we to tell the others to do something? So leading by example is important, developing those guidelines and good practices, putting them in place, preventing the problem in the first place, looking at the internal legal instruments and policies, making sure that there's a confidential and complaint-driven process so victims feel safe, punish violate those who make uh, violate the, the code, make sure there's training so people understand what they're doing and to provide information and awareness campaigns. Um, we need to uh, work on identifying solutions and giving people the skills and training. 
Um, the IPU Forum of Women Parliamentarians organized a parity debate on harassment and violence against women in 2016. Our IPU Committee on the Human Rights of Parliamentarians is acknowledging and incorporating its analysis the cases where the violations of human rights were gender-based attacks. The IPU, of course, works with the UN Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women in her upcoming report on violence against women in politics, and that's in another important way that we're reinforcing the message. We have a study, too, and I hope that uh, <laughs> it's available in several languages on our website, and I hope that uh, people will go in and, and download this and read up and um, give us your ideas for future solutions. Thanks, Joe. Thank you, Paddy, and thank you to the other panellists uh, who have shared experiences and lessons learned, uh, as well as programming solutions. Uh, I'm struck by the commonality of uh, themes that have emerged <coughs> already from what we've heard. Uh, Paddy mentioned the insidious uh, nature of online harassment, a, a form of uh, violence that we really didn't even experience 10 years ago, but which has now very much come to the fore. Uh, and this echoed very much something that Margaret said uh, in, in, the, in the very first substantive presentation. Uh, Paddy, I think you also mentioned the leading nature of the Bolivian law, something that Inez uh, elaborated on in her panel presentation, and something that uh, you know I think uh, other jurisdictions can look at very closely by way of, uh, of examples and lessons learned. And then uh, it also struck me that both you and Marisol uh, <coughs> mentioned two really important things that resonated with me at least. One was the fact that uh, resilient, strong women in politics who, won't, who simply won't be uh, intimidated and put down uh, is, is, a, is a hugely important uh, part of uh, what we need to ensure there are support structures for, and, and leading on from that point, that uh, insisting on uh, male allies in, in, in politics uh, and uh, ensuring that, uh, that men and boys understand the, the rights and wrongs of this issue and, and know what to do, uh, including on uh, ensuring that there are effective remedies and that perpetrators are punished and that environments are made safe. Uh, really is a, a, an extremely important aspect uh, of the, the issue that we're confronting today. We will have time for some questions, both online and uh, from those of you who are present here uh, in the building. But uh, what we want to, to now do is move to the last substantive um, part of, uh, of today's presentations. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm delighted to ask Miriam uh, Trabasi to... Uh, preside uh, over this uh, particular uh, and final part of the, uh, of the presentation, which is the relaunch of the UN Women uh, online platform and website. Uh, Miriam's been supporting the coordination of INO politics now for over two years, uh, based in the UN Women uh, hosting secretariat for the platform. Uh, she's particularly concentrated on the uh, knowledge management for the platform uh, in English, French and Arabic, uh, as well as on activities and partnerships. Uh, Miriam's a Tunisian national and, uh, it's, um, and also highly qualified. Uh, she has uh, degrees uh, from Grinnell College and Sciences Po Paris. Uh, a master's degree in international affairs from the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva, and uh, I'm delighted to now hand the floor to her. Thank you, Charles. Hi, everyone. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce you officially to I Know Politics' newly redesigned website. Um, as mentioned before, I Know Politics is a joint initiative of uh, UN Women, UNDP, the Interparliamentary Union, and International IDEA. Uh, it is an online workspace uh, exclusively dedicated to the topic of women's political participation um, and is designed to serve the, the needs of elected officials, um, candidates, political party members and leaders, civil society activists, uh, researchers, students, and anyone really who's interested in advancing women's political participation. Since the launch of the I Know Politics website, 
10 years ago, in March 2007, uh, more than, a, the, than 1 million users visited the website from every country in the world. Uh, the library that it hosts has more than 17,000 news and resources in English, Arabic, French, and Spanish. Um, so what we're trying to achieve with this new website that I'm going to show to you in a, in a few moments is to equip women at the national, regional, and grassroots levels uh, with tools and resources that can be used to inform and support efforts aimed at increasing the number of women in politics, but also improving the, comp the contributions uh, of women already in the political arena. Um, what we're also trying to achieve is to facilitate a global knowledge network um, that links users with experts, um, provides access to resources and global knowledge producers, and really offers an online workspace um, to, for communication between all these different stakeholders. So the platform does this on three fronts. It provides access to knowledge and it gives opportunity for uh, knowledge sharing and knowledge creation. So I'm going to show you now uh, how we do that through the website. All right, so as you can see, and our friends online now can see the website on the screen, this is our new look. We have a new logo, new colors, a new structure. Yeah. Uh, so the website is available in four languages. Here's the English. It's also available in Arabic in French and in Spanish. Uh, for the sake of this presentation, I'm gonna walk you through the website in English, but everything that I'll say in English also applies to the website and the other languages. So on the homepage, you have quick access to the latest news, events, resources, interviews, e-discussions. Uh, you also have quick access to material based on these uh, six focus areas. Uh, originally, we had five focus areas, but with the new website, uh, the new page of youth was born. It's one day old. Um, you can also access the different news and resources based on country and region by clicking on the different uh, country that you're interested in. Also on the access to knowledge, you can go to the library. And the library has the 17,000 resources and news that I mentioned earlier. Here in English, you see that we have more than 7,000. The rest are in the other languages. And to kind of make sense of all the resources and news that we have, you can filter by country, region, resource type, or theme. Uh, since we're here talking about violence against women in politics today, we can give that a try. So you see that the new guide uh, is here from UN Women and UNDP. Also, on the access to knowledge, you have, uh, like I mentioned earlier, the focus areas. Elections, for example, um, it's a quick way to uh, get access to the different news on a particular topic, but also the different resources. You have here the different resources from our four partners. To access more resources, you can go here to highlighted resources where you see more partner resources, but also resources from other sources <laughs> here. Another thing on the access to knowledge, you can go to an events calendar where you can see all the different events that happen around the world on the topic of women's political participation. Um, the new feature of, our, of the new website is that now you can filter by year after the events happen. For example, if I'm interested to see what happened around CSW this year, I can uh, pick the year and the month and I'll see the different events that happen. On the knowledge sharing and knowledge creation, if you don't find an answer to your questions in the library with all the different resources and news, you can ask one of our experts a question directly. Here's where you can find our experts. You can see a familiar face here. <laughs> Another way is to also... <laughs> Another way is to participate in our quarterly e-discussions. So every quarter we host an e-discussion on a particular uh, topic. For example, here you see that the latest one was on male champions. Uh, earlier this year, for example, we've had one on violence against women in politics. 
Uh, and the way e-discussions work, uh, participants submit their contributions, their answers to the number of questions that we set. And then at the end of each uh, e-discussion, you can access a summary of the discussion. So it's a nice and compact way to have this knowledge in one place. There's always many um, best practices and lessons learned from all of these uh, participants from all over the world. Another way is also uh, the webinars and the interviews. <coughs> For example, recently, along with our e-discussion on male champions, we've also had a webinar. And you can go there and find the video, the recording of the webinar. And we also do interviews with women and men, politicians and practitioners. Uh, who talk about women's political participation. The women politicians tell us about how they started their career in politics, the challenges that they face and how they face them. So it's really a great way uh, to get direct advice from people already in politics. Um, as you can see here, the four last ones were with men because again, the male champions discussion that we had. Before I wrap it up, I wanted to say that we're very active on social media and the proof were today uh, streaming live on Facebook. Please follow us on Facebook and Twitter and don't forget to sign up for our newsletter down here um, if you never want to miss anything about women's political participation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary. Uh, and uh, you know, we really do commend the website, the, the newly relaunched website, uh, which was done in response to an evaluation of the of the site, and it really is, uh, is looking fantastic, so thank you for, for the work that was done. Um, so we, we, we're very fortunate still to have our panellists here, uh, and if there are any questions online or from, uh, from observers uh, in the event, uh, please uh, do feel free to put them now, or observations or discussion points. Well, I think it was a very rich discussion. So uh, I think what and, and what that signals is that uh, you know we can uh, we can be pleased that, that we've uh, uh, been able to to ventilate some of the issues today with the with the experts that have contributed, and now we have the uh, uh, the, the the relaunched platform as well to, to rely on. So I'd like I'd like you all to join in thanking me uh, th thanking the presenters. Um, including Margaret, who has generously stayed online uh, in the in the Swiss Parliament buildings in, in Bern. Beautiful Thank you, Margaret. <laughs> yes, Thank you all. it's Thank lovely you. To, lovely to see you again, and uh, and and all the best for the evening, and uh, all the best to you all for the day. Thank you again. <laughs> and, and, and of course, thank you to IPU for hosting this event.